Hey everybody, uh, sorry about the delay there. Had a, a few technical difficulties, but um, but worked through them here. So uh, appreciate everybody kind of hanging on uh, for the time being. Um, we are getting started with our webinar on finishing castings. So anything from polishing, uh, painting, and powder coating, um, we will be discussing today. If you do have any questions, make sure that you are sharing them in the questions section. Um, I appreciate everybody uh, already entering in where they're from. Um, but uh, yeah, any, any questions during the webinar, please make sure you put them in the questions section. Um, we'll do what we can to make sure that we get them answered uh, live on the air today. Um, if any go unanswered during the, the webinar this afternoon, uh, we'll make sure we get them answered offline today. So I appreciate everybody joining today. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to go ahead and get started with our uh, panelists here. And so today we have uh, two guests um, um, here with us. A lot of you remember Tim Weber, uh, the bike enthusiast, uh, been in permanent mold casting industry for about 46 years. Sorry, not 46, I'm dating you there, Tim, for 36 years. Wow. Uh, and, and today uh, today we have a special guest on the line as well, uh, Jerry Burchette. Uh, knows everything there is to know about uh, power coating and painting. Um, Jerry loves to spend a lot of time with his kids and, or, and his grandkids um, and his family. Uh, spends a lot of time doing uh, camping and boating activities. And if it, Tim ever gets a flat tire, Jerry's there to pick him up with his boat. With that, <laughs> there you go. Uh, go ahead and hand it off to you guys. All right, so we, we're, we're going to have a great one today, folks. Uh, Jerry is truly the wizard of coding. He also happens to be a very good friend of my brother, Len, and one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. So this is going to be a good one. All right, Jerry, so here's what I got. Uh, I got castings in my machine shop. They're coming out of my machine shop. I put them in a box. I ship them to the coder. So walk, let's talk, walk us through the, the what you will look for and some of the um, methods you might do to prepare that for, for coding. Okay, um, and thanks for those nice words, Tim. I appreciate that. Um, what what um, the first thing I'm going to do when I open the box is I'm going to have the print with me, and I'm going to look at the casting to see if it was uh, any prep work was done before it was put in the box. If it comes straight out of the mold, cooled and packed, and I'm going to coat that, then I'm going to look for flash. And if the if the uh, spec says remove all flashing then I'm going to um, be as um, easy on the abrasion of removing that flash and getting that casting ready for coating. Now, if I'm putting a um, air dry primer on it and an air dry uh, paint, I'm gonna just clean it up really well. Uh, I may put some um, anodize on it. I may just do a, a chemical wash where I put uh, uh, iron phosphate or uh, any of, uh, there's so many nano um, chemicals today that are so friendly uh, that I would prepare it to, so that the paint has something to bite to. And I'm gonna process it. And when it's done, it's gonna look uh, very good. I'm gonna wrap it back up, put it back in the box, send it to the customer. Now that's for air dry. Now if I have a baking system, because castings have air entrapped in them. If I do not degas those, I have a really high chance of blowing the casket up, the casting. And what I call, when I say blowing it up, uh, the paint goes on, it looks really good. We put it in the oven, but because it gets up to 300 to 400 degrees, that casting expands, it releases the air, and it blows the paint off the part. So what I would do with that particular casting, and this happens more with high-end um, heavy castings. Uh, Tim and I have a little bit of history with that together. But I would pull that casting, and I call it the 1515 rule. If my paint or powder, and we'll just use 325 degrees as our set point that says this particular product, this particular coating for this casting needs 10 minutes at 325 degrees to cure. 
then before I do anything, after I've prepped the casting, I'm going to put it in an oven at 340 degrees for 15 minutes. I'm going to expand that casting, let that gas, we call it degassing, let all the gas, the air get out of it, cool it back to ambient. It's going to go back to its original, uh, everything's going to be the same as it was when it came out of the box. Now when I apply the paint, it's only going to be in the oven for 10 minutes at 325. That casting will not open back up because I, when I did my 1515 rule, I degassed the casting. I'm going to be able to paint parts one right after the other, and they're all going to be great. That 1515 rule is my, always my starting point. If I can go to 10 minutes, depending on the thickness of the casting, I run tests until I get that, but I always start out at 15 degrees higher, 15 degrees, I mean, 15 minutes longer than the cure so that I know that first casting is going to be perfect. Hey, Jerry, I had a good question come in. I'm gonna back up a slide here. Um, so, are the customers re required to, to provide this process sheet or is that often developed uh, internally uh, with back and forth with the customer? That's a great question. Normally, normal, that is a wonderful question. And, and in my 38 years of doing this, um, I've always tried to get my meetings with, if, if the caster is sending his castings out to be finished, I like to get the finisher and the caster in a room together and with a whiteboard or, you know, we use flip charts, whatever, and let's write down, let's write down the process. And then we go, well, we don't need the third step in this one. So I always like for it to be a collaboration so that the, the caster knows what he needs to do before he puts that casting in a shipping container to go to the finisher, and the finisher needs to know exactly what that caster or the caster's end user is looking for. There are some castings that I have uh, powder coated and liquid coated before, and they didn't really care about bubbles and things because it was an internal part. But when we're talking about the kind of business that, that that Batesful does, that Batesful products does, they deal in some very, very high-end uh, users. The, the people that are going to be the one installing and that's their part, they demand perfection. Uh, uh, Tim and I and Lynn, we worked on a project several years ago where there, there couldn't be a speck of dirt anywhere on that part. That's how critical it was. So yes, writing up that procedure needs to be, you need to have all the teams sitting in a room and agreeing on that so that there's no question. Otherwise, you know, you may send a thousand parts to a finisher and he goes, this is how I normally do them. But when they get back to the caster, he says, well, wait a minute, my end user will not accept it. So it is always good to collaborate and write those processes. So, yeah. So, so from a uh, from a uh, customer perspective, it, it's it's very valuable to have them come in and really have an understanding of what they want, the end goal in the project, um, and then from your your point there to really collaborate with the the production team, um, whether you know any anybody in the industry that's looking to get that that coding. Uh, uh, completed on the project to, to make sure that they're sharing the, as much information as possible with that, that team that they choose. Hey, uh, Jerry, yeah. I got another, another quick question I've got is, so you've got the process sheet that you've written up for the casting. Let's say this part goes on like a medical cart. So you've got the casting as the base and then maybe steel, uh, steel or some sort of fabrications, maybe some tubing. Um, is the process sheet good for every, that, is that one process sheet good for the entire uh, assembly, or is there a process sheet per the casting, a process sheet per the extrusion? In other words, would, or do you just throw them on the line and run them all through together at the same time? 
Tim, that's a great question. The good the good thing is the steel parts, absolutely. You can batch those with the castings when the castings are prepared for finishing. Um, normally, aluminum extrusions, they can stand the way that they're made, uh, they can stand the heat as is. So if it is an assembled part, that you're going to be liquid coating or powder coating, and it is a baking system, your secret is your cleaning. Uh, you would want to use a, we call it a, a, a multi-metal coater cleaner because for paint to adhere to aluminum, you have to have fluoride in your cleaner. Now it's a very small percentage of fluoride, but without the fluoride, the the especially extrusions, they the paint will not adhere. You will have loss of adhesion. So so I think that that's that's a great uh, great response there. I think that kind of goes into the slide that you were talking about here on cleaning. Um, you know, there's not a one way. It doesn't seem like there's a one way fit fits every every specific casting, right? So um, a, a good question came across on that. You know, is there a process sheet specific to each part or do you use a general uh, cleaning te uh, technology for each part? Well, if you're using a, you would have, the best thing to do is get with your chemical supplier, but make sure it is, it is a multi-metal coder cleaner. And what that does in one step, it cleans the part, and it also puts the coating on there that is reacting with the metals that you know the the the, the phosphate if you're using that uh it's going to react with the steel and and prepare the steel it's going to leave a, a the conversion coating on there and on the aluminum because there's fluoride it's going to etch it so you yes you can paint those together but it it is critical very critical that whether you're dipping or whether you're spraying through a, a full line system or whether you're cleaning with a hand wand and there Jenny makes uh, Jenny Sting makes them um Electro Sting makes them uh their their handheld cleaners cleaner systems you always want to use a multi metal coater cleaner right uh -huh. So we got this. So we got a clean part. We got clean casting. Now we're ready to apply it. And you've mentioned a couple different methods of applying. So maybe we should talk first. Um, maybe paint versus powder coat first. Let's talk about that. Can you give us a little uh, comparison in, in the direction the industry is going? Yes, um, the industry and and this has been a trend for. Uh, a, a number of years, I would say for the last 25 years, uh, it, is, it, it is rapidly moving more to powder coating because powder coating is a true green technology. It does not have any volatile organic compounds in it. And when we talk about that in the paint and powder industry, we just refer to it as VOC. And you may even see something, uh, an EPA article that will say, you know, we're cutting down on the VOC. Well, that's volatile organic compounds. That's the, the carbons that are going, everything that's going into the atmosphere. So what, again, that's leading more to powder, which leads more to um, the, the tendency of people to try to shortcut and then they have bad parts. Um, so if you're doing an air dry primer or one coat paint, you do not have to degas the casting. All you've got to do is prep that casting, clean it, get your coating on there for adhesion, and you can process it all day long without the added step of degassing. A lot of companies now, and I'm working with one in particular, 
they have actually, they're going to add an oven in their line so that they're deep, they can go ahead and load their casting. They will degas them. Then they will go through the cleaner. Then they will go through the powder booth and then they will be cured. And so they're not having to handle them three or four times. They're doing it all in line and doing it in one step. Nice. When, when would you primer a part? And what does, what, does, what does that do for you? Well, a lot of times, uh, and that's a, that is a really good question because, again, it gets back to process and what the end user is expecting. A lot of times you'll get and where, where you've got your flash area, uh, you want to, you know, get that as, as, as nice and looking as good as you can. You want your surface to look good. But a lot of times, um, you know, castings will have scratches on them, uh, whether that's, you know, coming out of the mold or, or whether it's the way they're packed or in transit. And so putting a primer on and then bringing that out, the primer is hiding we we say it this way, it hides all the sins. Uh it makes the part smooth and uh just lays the coating down so much better. Nice. Because any any imperfection like a scratch or a gouge, if it is not repaired and your customer is looking for a class A finish, then you are producing a rejected part. And that, you know, a rejected part equals three parts. You, you've lost three parts when you reject a part. You lost that part, the part that you could have painted with it, and then you lose that line time when you have to repaint that one. So it really becomes cost effective to know what the expectations are and address that in the process. I think to that point, Jerry, a good good question came up from uh, from Justine here. Um, you know, is it, it sounds like a lot of this is on the process sheet kind of built up front. So Justine had a question, and Ron had a question around, you know, the the process that's set up. You know, are there specific cleaners that you you recommend? Um, and then is there a, a difference between different casting types in the way you process it? Yes. That's that's a really good question. Um, magnesium castings are a nightmare. Um, that 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 really gets into um, very detailed process. Uh, okay. That process sheet that process sheet becomes very very long. Uh, the aluminum castings and the zinc uh, castings um, they are much easier to work with. Um, the question was. I recommend a specific cleaner. You can you can contact any of the chemical companies. There's a couple that I deal very closely with, and I don't mind telling you their names. I, I'm not selling their product. I'm just telling you they have great products. Uh, we at Patriot, we have one. Uh, Calvary Chemical out of Cincinnati has one. And then Coral Chemical, uh, which they're everywhere, they have a really good met, multi metal coater cleaner. Uh, so, but that is that is in your notes. Um, the person that asked that question, just make sure that you always ask, is this a multi metal coater cleaner? So that you know that if it's an aluminum um, uh, casting, that you're going to etch it and you're going to you're not going to worry about having loss of adhesion. Okay, great. Um, D David had an interesting question here as well. Um, so if you have a, a, an aluminum casting that you heat treat, does the process still need a bake-off or a degassing step? Okay, uh, the, the first thing you would do is you would look at the heat treat and see what temperature was that product uh, processed through? If that heat treat is at a higher temperature than the coating that's going to be used, you should be able to go straight from the heat treat, cool to ambient, and then either 
spray your wet paint or your powder coating on there. Absolutely. A yeah, and a good question, and that is a great question because a lot of folks now are requesting lower cured powders, and powder continues to come down in temperature. Uh, 15 years ago, I would have told you I can't, can't get you a powder less than 375 degrees. Today, there's some on the market that are 275. Uh, and there are, um, I know the, I know the Illinois, uh, Illinois, uh, university, it, uh, received another grant from the federal government that they are continuing to work on even lower, uh, resins, uh, for the ability to powder coat substrates that cannot stand, you know, the temperatures of 325 or greater. So, it, you know, that, that's, a, that's a good point there. So it, it sounds like it all depends, you know, again, it's pro process specific and, and job specific. You know, your, your heat treat could, could get you to the temp that it, it could bake it off um, in that process. But then there's, you know, other low temp heat treats that, that don't get you there. Um, and then additionally, yeah. it depends on the powder you're using too, right? So it's not necessarily yeah. specific to, you know, part of our casting process. It, 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 it's all down to the nitty gritty details. Absolutely, absolutely, and it gets down to you know the chemistries of the powder, uh, what what finish you want. If you can stand some orange peel, uh, and it doesn't have to be a smooth finish, then th the lower you can go in the temperature for your powder. But when you lower the temperature of powder, and you make it cure at a quicker and lower temperature, you also impede the flow of the powder when it becomes a liquid because the powder becomes a liquid in the heat and then it bakes out if you can stand an orange peel look which is a rough rougher look then you can talk to your powder coating supplier and say hey i'm okay with orange peel but i really really don't want to degas these and they can stand 300 degrees and then th then you can work with that Okay. Hey, hey, Jerry, it looks like we may have lost your, your video, uh, but your, your volume uh, is still coming through loud and clear. So we're, we're going to keep on uh, going here. Okay, great. Um, great. Okay. So, so uh, anybody who does have questions, um, a lot of good ones coming across, uh, just want to remind you to make sure you're entering them in the question section. Um, we'll, we'll try to get them answered live on here if we can. Um, and again, if, if not, we'll make sure that we follow up with an answer after the webinar is over today. So, hey, Jerry, so let's talk a little bit about the types of powder coating finishes and, and maybe some of the properties of some of the uh, various powders. Okay, that'd be great, great. Um, the most popular powder in the world is a TGIC polyester. Uh, and the reason it's so popular is it is you can use it in the interior, but it's made for exterior. So if you're looking at a, a rail fence or a really nice painted gate at a gated community, you would want to use a TGIC powder because it's going to give you much, much light, uh, just like a, an acrylic uh, paint for a car would give you. Um, there are powder coatings now that are um, they're very expensive. Uh, but uh, uh, they will last, they, they are AMA approved, and they will last 30 years uh, with no problem. So TGIC polyesters are, are the most popular powder that is made. Europe wants to back down on the isocyanate that is in the TGIC, that's what the I stands for, and we call it a... Uh, uh, TGIC free polyester. Again, it is an exterior powder. Uh, there is an acrylic. The problem with acrylics, they, the good news is acrylics last forever. The bad news about an acrylic powder is it will contaminate any other powder. So people that use acrylics, that's what they use, just acrylic. And that is like if you go out and buy a 
charcoal grill. Uh, and, and it's, you know, two feet square, eight inches deep, more than likely if it's powder coated, it's powder coated with acrylic because it can stand um, the heat. Then there are hybrids. And this is a blend of an epoxy and a polyester. If you have a powder coated desk in your office, that's hybrid powder. That's what the metal office furniture industry uses. And then there are epoxies. Now, epoxies, have, there are many epoxies. Epoxies are only for interior. If you put it outside within 30 days, it will chalk and start to um, um, lose its shine and its color. It is used a lot. It's called um, fusion applied epoxies and if you look at as you're driving down the road and you look at a fire hydrant that fire hydrant is coated inside with fusion epoxy and the reason that is is that you can build that up to 20 or 30 mils thick but again it never sees sunshine because it's inside also epoxies are very resistant to chemicals and so batteries, a battery tray that batteries are going to set in would call for an epoxy uh, powder. Um, there are high temperature powders now. Um, many of you are probably familiar with Traeger. That's a very popular pellet grill. Um, there's many of those. Um, I only use Traeger because that's the one my wife has. Uh, but that is uh, that is coated with a high temperature paint that can withstand up to 1600 degrees. There again, if you're painting high temperature powder, that's all you can paint because it will contaminate all the other uh, chemistries of powder. Hey, hey, Jerry, our good friend, our mutual friend, uh, Terry, uh, has some paints or powders or coatings that some of them insulate. And some of them actually do the opposite and help the uh, the part uh, you know get rid of the heat. Can you is that yes. is that a powder or is that a paint? How does that work? Well, you can do either one. The the, the secret is the pigmentation. Um, there is a company that is um, the best in the world, and what they do is they make pigments that actually reflect heat. And so you paint the part, uh, a good example is a window. You paint a window frame and the sun, instead of it heating it off, heating it, it loses heat because the paint, paint will not allow the heat to come in. It reflects the heat away. So you, yes, but you can do two extremes. You can use an insulation uh, uh, powder that at high mills it will insulate the part and on the other extreme with the with the proper pigmentation uh it will reflect the heat away from it nice nice let's talk about um okay so now the paint's on there or the powder is on there how do i know how do i know if it's it's going to hold how, how do i know if it's going to peel off or you know what what do we do what do you do what kind of tests do you do or recommend uh, as a as a uh, just to ensure that you've done the right process and the proper procedures were followed yep the best thing to do is to buy a cross hatch adhesion test kit uh, that will cut uh straight lines you cut north to south and then you cut east to west and you form these tiny 16 inch, 16th of an inch squares. Then you put tape on there. You press the tape down very, very hard. You know, all the, all the, the um, ad adhesive that's on the tape, you, you've got it in the grooves. You wait one minute and then you rapidly jerk that away. If none of the squares come off, that is scored as a 5B, which means 
100% adhesion. Another thing that you can test is you can take a pencil and you can push a number two pencil. You flatten the, the tip of the pencil. You gouge it into the paint. And if it breaks the lead, you have a, a good coating and a cured coating. If it goes and it chips the paint off or the powder, you're more than likely under cured because when powder is under cured, it is almost like glass. You could take a part and bang them together and you will actually see the coating shatter. Those are the two best ways. The quick way is to take either MEK, which you can buy at Lowe's, it's methyl ethyl ketone, or acetone, which is basically fingernail polish remover, and you saturate a rag, you put it on the part, and you take about a three inch swipe back and forth, and that's called one rub, it's called one double rub. Do that 25 times in the same spot, and if you do not go through the substrate, you have a good part. So how do I know, so in our industry, in, in the casting industry, I can take a, 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 a slice of a casting and send it off and have it analyzed, and they'll tell me what's in that. How do I know the powder's getting good? How do I know what's in the powder? Well, you, you will get from your uh, powder source uh, a safety data sheet, and that safety data sheet will give you all the information that's required by the uh, federal government. The best thing, and then you'll get a technical data sheet. You should always, you should always demand um, a safety data sheet and a technical data sheet. What I do with my large OEM customers, um, job shops don't normally re require um, a certification form. But what I do is I sit down with my OEM folks, we look at their spec, and we look at, okay, how thick, thick does this need to be? What temperature do we need to bake this at? What pencil hardness do we want? The crosshatch, what gloss? All those things come into play, even the color readings. We have machines that we can read colors that the naked eye cannot pick up on but we set those standards and then we send a certification sheet certifying that this powder meets or exceeds the customer's uh, designated requirements in their specifications. Um, so I can buy a ton of metal today and I can use it and pour it three years from now. Is there a life to the powder? That is a great question. Powder coating needs to be stored in a uh, controlled environment. I always tell folks, let's try not to get the, the room over 75 degrees, and let's try to keep the humidity right around 40. Now, you will get different powders that will tell you different things, but that's a great rule of thumb. Have a powder room, controlled environment, that powder will last unopened for a year what most powder companies will say i have and we were talking about our mutual uh friend a, a while ago we sprayed powder one time that was 10 years old the only difference was the gloss had fallen by five points so it's all about uh, kind of environment have you stored the powder in if you store it in a building that gets up to 120, 130 degrees, the powder particles will start to melt to each other. And when you spray it, you'll have dirt. We call it low film grit um, all over your parts because powder reacts to its environment. So rule of thumb, 75 degrees, 40% humidity a year, you're going to be great. Uh, just real quick, let's say there is a reject. Can they? Can that part be reworked? Absolutely. 
you can do many ways of reworking powder. It's going to depend on the powder itself. It's going to depend on the thickness that the powder was applied to. And it's going to depend on where the surface is. If it's a class A surface, a lot of times it's best to just go ahead and strip the part. Um, there are some really good strips on the market today that um, I use at my customers to clean their hooks so that their ground is always good. But um, you, uh, you can sand it, you can feather it out uh, if it's just a, a given spot on a part, and then you just spray the powder right over it, and uh, powders will intercoat with each other it, unless they are made um, like a high temperature or an acrylic or a chemical resistant, highly chemical resistant, the surface tension is going to be so tight that you would have to strip that part down. But sanding and recoating is done every day in, in just about every shop. Okay, nice. But again, Jay, too, it gets back to the process sheet of how critical that, that surface has to be. Sure. So you've been doing this a lot of years. Let's talk a little bit about technology and innovation you know, what excites you? What are you seeing uh, moving forward in this industry? What, uh, you know, and I, and, I, and I had this conversation with, with a new customer uh, yesterday. Uh, I, you would think after 39 years of doing this that I would be bored. Hmm. I, I learn something every day. Um, I love the innovation of the low cures that are coming on, online. One of the things that excites me is the metallics that we're able to do today that even 10 years ago, uh, we played with it, but we never could perfect it. And um, I deal in the casket industry and I have a casket manufacturer and we actually are selling him powder coating for his caskets because now we can make them look like the wet caskets with all the metallic in them. So mm. metallics and that coming, uh, and there's two types of powders in metallics that you can have a bonded metallic, which is you put it in a high pressure um, uh, collider and you put the resin in and the resin and the, the metallics collide with each other. The resin wraps around it. You can reclaim that. But if you have a heavily post blended metallic you have to spray to waste because if you try to reclaim it you get it out of balance and then the color just goes dramatically uh sideways the other thing that is really getting popular on motorcycles and on car parts is they're called candies and what you do is you lay down a dye field um red, blue, green, or yellow, and then you put a clear over it, and it looks like a piece of candy. And so they're referred to as candies. Mm. Those are always exciting because they're so innovative. Mm. But then you have wrinkles, uh, you have multicolors. Uh, when I first got in the industry, and there's probably, today now, there's probably less than 100 of us that in 1982 were, involved in powder coating. It was new technology in the U.S. from Europe. Um, started in the late 70s. Um, when I got into the industry, there were only five manufacturers in the U.S. Today, there's probably a couple hundred. Um, but in those days, we made straight epoxies, straight polyesters. Uh, we did not have a wide range of colors. Today, if you look at an RAL chart, are a Pantone chart, uh, and you see a thousand colors, we can make those in uh, powder coating today where we couldn't 38 years ago. And Jerry, a uh, good question came across from uh, Jason here and was wondering with like the, the silver and metallics, and I think you were, you were getting there, um, you know, there's a lot of time and effort put into mirror polishing. Uh, are you able, are there coatings out there that are able to produce that now? 
You know what? We're getting we're getting closer and closer and closer to that. Okay. Uh, I can I can make a mirror coating, but it has to be clear coated. Um, and the reason is um, the the pigmentation that we have to use to get that mirror look um, when it sees humidity, uh, it will start to turn black. And so what we do with those is we lay down a really beautiful uh, chrome looking powder and then we come back with a clear for longevity. Nice. Okay. But those are out there. Also, uh, there's um, anodyne, there's powder coatings now that actually look like um, chromates and anodizing. Uh, and those have really come on uh, in the last two years. Huh. Okay. Hmm. Well, Jerry, I, we could talk about this all day. I think this is a very, very interesting uh, topic. And I think, you, you know, your, your experience in the industry is, is very expansive and, and you know, you, we could talk forever about it. Um, we did have a couple of questions I wanted to get answered before we, we ended this today. Um, one of which came across from John here. Uh, have, you, have you seen any robotics uh, being used in the, the powder coating lines? Yes, that is getting more popular. Uh, in fact, um, uh, robotic powder coaters are um, especially high end uh, are going to robotics. Uh, and it's very interesting because I love watching them. Again, um, if you know if somebody, if I had a potential customer and they said, "Jerry, we want to look at a robot," then I have three labs that I can go to that have robots set up with a powder gun mounted on it already, and all we do is program that part, and and we're good to go. Uh, so yes, robotics are becoming uh, very popular now. We already have why are in and out, up and down of our powders. We now are starting to see the Z axis where we actually can ask the gun to go inside a part, powder coat the inside and come back out and it re index. So we've gone from just X to X and Y to now we're X, Y, and Z. So it's ever changing on the equipment side nice awesome um one last question here um so is there any special consideration when going from a vapor blasting uh, to a powder coating on aluminum if, you, if you're vape you're vapor cleaning is that what you're doing yeah yep okay again um you as far as cleaning the part that's wonderful um the the issue again would be uh did i degas it and and if i were vapor doing that i would degas it first okay okay degas then go to the vapor then go to the powder great well, Jerry, I appreciate your time today. Uh, Tim, yours as well. I um, wanted to let everybody know the next webinar we have coming up will be on Tuesday, May 18th at the same time, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll be talking about what is involved in the coating process. So you heard a lot on the upfront uh, conversation here today about, you know, what, what's the customer's ex expectation? Um, you know, what's the process plan? Um, so a very uh, interesting conversation we have coming up on uh, May 18th. Um, any questions that we didn't get to today, uh, again, you know, we'll make sure that we, we get those answered offline here. Appreciate everybody's time this afternoon, uh, and have a great day. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. You're the best. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. Pre I appreciate the invitation. Everybody Anytime. have a great day. All right. Bye-bye.